internet and welcome to episode 6 of On War the Podcast. My name is Alistair and I'm joined by my good friend and colleague Austin. And in this episode we'll be discussing terrorism and its inescapable, though perhaps overstated, role in modern conflict. This episode we're talking about terrorism and I guess before we get started we do need to acknowledge that this is potentially what's a much more politically contentious topic uh, than some of the stuff we've covered before and although we have touched on conflicts and wars in previous episodes I guess this is one episode where we might well be touching on uh, areas that may well have directly impacted our listeners or someone they know. So before we get started, I feel like we should perhaps, particularly in the light of uh, the recent incidents in London, acknowledge that what we present here is an investigation into an area of study to understand conflict. And the perspectives we put forward here are, in, are our own, um, that we gain through our research, our studies, and our, um, our explorations in the field. And it's an important field to analyze, but we do so in a way we hope is quite respectful, to the incidents involved, and I guess it's always in. I mean, we do this. We we try to understand this, Austin, to to hopefully one day make a, a difference and and try and reduce the incidences of conflict. That's why we get into conflict studies and try to understand any problem, isn't it? Absolutely, and I think that it it is certainly indicative of the times we live in that of all the types of conflict we've discussed so far, there is a need to have such a disclaimer at the beginning of this episode. Uh, obviously all respect and, and sympathy to anyone affected by the, the latest incident in London. This is a subject area where lots of people will, will sort of dabble on the edges. Unfortunately, it is an area that is driven inherently by death and, and by tragedy. And in order to understand it and in order to combat it, and of course to effectively combat it and reduce its impact, we have to understand it. It is necessary to analyze events like this in a way that can sometimes come across as dispassionate um, and certainly can sometimes come across as disrespectful, um, particularly when you start dealing with it at this level, when you're dealing with people that understand it and are talking to other people that understand it, the outside of the, the what you would consider the classic public discourse. So it's important to acknowledge these things, but as you say, that you need to be able to engage in them dispassionately and really try and cut through the narrative uh, to get to the meat of, of, of the problem. So on that, uh, let's crack on. And I guess the first thing that we do and, and at the start of every episode is, is start reaching immediately for definitions to try and ground ourselves. And particularly building on last episode, I think we need to sort of start with a dividing line between terrorism and insurgency, because like we said last episode, particularly in, in modern theatres of operations in the Middle East, uh, in Northern Africa, these are two terms that often get bundled together. And often, even if you look at uh, attacks in the West, they're bundled into the, the concept of a global insurgency. But, I mean, that's not a terribly useful position if you're trying to understand the practice of terrorism. I mean, we had this discussion uh, somewhat in last episode, and as with every episode, it is good if you get the chance to go back and, and listen to the previous episodes. The issue we have with distinguishing insurgency from terrorism is that an insurgency is a type of conflict. Right? An insurgency is a, a mode through which someone constructs their discourse of violence. However, a terrorist act is typically applied by the, the term, the discourse that surrounds terrorism, is usually applied by the victim or by their state-based allies. It is incredibly rare for a terrorist organization or any organization, a violent non-state actor, to say that they are a terrorist group, to use that language. And it's simply because the discourse has evolved that way. Inside of academia, there's a, this is an incredibly contested term. So how you might define terrorism and, and how you might sort of start with trying to understand it. I had a quote here from Alex Schmidt, who's made a little bit of a, a life of trying to collate these definitions. And he says that authors have spilled as much ink trying to define the concept as the actors of terrorism have spilled blood. This was from 1988, and he and Albert Longman in um, the book Political Terrorism had come to about 100, 100 different 
uh, distinct definitions that might cover terrorism. The most recent book and a, a good sort of touchstone for any students out there, the Routledge Handbook on Terrorism Research, which Schmidt edited with Eason, um, Schmidt had come up with, uh, had increased that number to about 250 distinct academic, governmental, and intergovernmental definitions for terrorism. So it, it's one of those things. It's, it's quite a ter uh, contested concept, isn't it? Absolutely. And there's a couple of distinct influences on why we've ended up in the situation we have. And I think it, it certainly doesn't do our academic community uh, any favours, um, particularly with those who are operating at the sharper end of the stick, in that post 9-11, which while it was obviously a tragedy, was a distinct outlier. We had this immense infl influx of resources and interest in the field. And almost overnight, the field absolutely exploded. Um, for want of a better term, in size and scope. And we had scholars from every which field, from economics all the way through to, to more conventional social scientists and legal scholars, who all jumped into this field of terrorism studies with this concept that terrorism was somehow new post 9-11. And that, we're going to talk about that in a minute. But the result of that was the creation of these snowballing effects where everyone was starting everyone else, which fed into the highly politicized nature of what we were working with at the time, which has landed us with this incredibly politicized term, which carries with it its own discourse of legitimization, whereby you can legitimize violence and, and quite often violence that would otherwise be unsustainable um, against individuals and organizations when you collate them with this terrorism discourse and quite often it is insurgent groups that are collated with that discourse and i think as alistair mentioned it's created this situation where you know we do have 250 definitions um and those are just the recognized ones everyone has their own working definition yeah this is i mean something i've been a little bit guilty of myself is, is crafting a definition within the scope of a research piece or a paper to suit the purposes of that particular paper the objectives on the contention I'm trying to frame there. And there's one quite prominent critic of this approach, Boz Gaynor. Gaynor said, argued quite early on that this was a, an incredibly problematic approach that would actually harms any efforts to try and combat terrorism or try and prevent terrorism by creating such a dyslexic um, divisions within, within the research community. Uh, and he had a very straightforward approach to this, which... I can respect in a lot of ways. Uh, I don't necessarily agree with him, but um, I can respect the effort he's trying to do. And so he argued that the debates around defining terrorism could be solved very simply by extending conventional uh, laws and, and particularly norms, international norms about the conduct, conduct of war and differentiate between a guerrilla war and insurgency, which we've talked about before, and terrorism, purely by the scope of their targets. Uh, any military target, security personnel or, or military personnel of a state could be deemed as, as being reasonably legitimate or within the bounds of legitimacy, and so could be considered part of an insurgency or a guerrilla war. Whereas the moment any group or actor um, started targeting civilians, they became terrorist. And he argues that by carrying out terrorist attacks within that definition, the perpetrators make themselves the enemies of all mankind, regardless of their motivation. But that in itself has its own um, issues, I think. Partially, we lack a sort of international consensus that defines, that, that makes a distinction between terrorist and guerrilla fighter. I think that that's the core issue with that idea. But I think it goes beyond that. It goes to the point where we're conflating a type of conflict with a tool of conflict. A terrorist attack, I mean, my personal working definition, and obviously I've got my own definition and therefore I'm a little hypocritical when I have a go at others in the field for having theirs is that a terrorist attack is a, a threat, is a use of force or a threat and use of force against a civilian population or object that's designed to inflict terror for a political purpose. Now, that could be any one of a million types of con types of attack from your standard suicide bombings all the way through to, you know, quite legitimate seeming special forces operations. I think a terrorist attack um, or a terroristic action can be conducted by any, any actor, state or non-state. The label itself, I think, 
has become distinct from the actors. And that has meant that acts that don't necessarily exactly fit the definition of terrorism, in my mind, um, and also with things like the Global Terrorism Database, there's also record instances where they don't match a same, an objective definition, but they are labeled with the, the discoursal title of, of a terrorist act. And that then lumps them into a category. Now, that's not to pass moral judgment on the efficacy of that attack. And in, in almost all cases, they are, they are horribly morally reprehensible. Um, but I think that we're conflating here um, the, the act itself with the type of conflict being insurgency. And I think that is where the root of the issue comes from when we talk about how the term has become politicized. And of course, once anything becomes politicized to the extent it has, it becomes far more powerful in, it, in its um, normative value, in, it, in its value as a label, than it does to the people in the decision-making areas as a sort of objective concept. To give you an example from one of our previous episodes about Colombia, if you track the amount of U.S. support for the Colombian government in combating the various insurgencies, and they were occasionally guilty of, of terroristic acts, but otherwise they were mainstream insurgencies. If you track the funding uh, the Colombian government received from the U.S. and the support it received in other domains, it starts to stagnate in, in, the, late, in the 1990s because the war on drugs becomes de-emphasized and it's not till after 2001 and 9-11 that these groups, particularly um, FARC and the ELN, get uh, labelled as not drug runners, but narco-terrorists. You see an explosion of funding, and you see it all across the world. Any group that could be labelled as a terrorist group by a government or an organisation um, served as a fantastic way of attracting funds, particularly from the United States and other Western countries to try and suppress them, because they were automatically the bad guys. Yeah, absolutely. We, we certainly see that elsewhere, and even in modern, the, the more modern era. I mean, even in 2015, um, the Ukrainian government declared the pro-Russian rebels as terrorists. Now, this had some practical impacts, the most immediate one being that there was no way for them to formally conduct peace negotiations directly after that, which put paid to ongoing Russian-backed efforts to, to start the CFSI process. The Russians have done the same in Chechnya. Um, the Chinese do the same with the Uyghur population in Western China. The end result is that once a group is labelled with this this title, to an extent they do become, you know, this, this concept of uh, enemies of mankind. And the practical impact of that, at least in my opinion, is that we're more willing to accept a level of brutality, a level of government force that we would otherwise not accept. The drone strike campaign across the Middle East and Africa is a classic example of this. The What we see, and we'll talk about this a little later on, the links between immigration and, and terrorism meant that it even got to the extent that Ital an Italian politician was advocating the use of drone strikes against staging areas in Libya. That is the extent to which this, the, what seems like a fairly you know, scholarly debate about the impact of discourse. This is the practical effect it, is, it has on security issues involved. And this, the, the problem, and, and going back to our discussions about insurgency, is, of course, by eliminating that, that ability to, to negotiate in a, in a conflict zone um, or by emphasizing hard, what, we, what we'd call hard power responses, that is, militarized responses, increased security. Insurgencies and terrorists both play to that sort of reaction. So it sort of it does it doesn't provide an exit strategy for the um, for the conflict. Well, to an extent, it, it does it does block that direct end of the conflict. But another thing it does though is, if you can effectively label an insurgency, and I'm specifically talking about an actual active rebellion type insurgency here, if you can label an insurgency a terrorist movement, and we saw this uh, you mentioned with narco terrorists, and also with the the left-wing groups in the in the late 80s, early 70s. If you can label a group a terrorist group, then any state that is backing that group then has to go on the defensive as to why they're backing that group. And particularly if, like someone like the Ukraine, for instance, you can get the US to recognise your your designation of that group as a terrorist organisation. Immediately, that that group will be targeted with sanctions, with funding blocks 
Um, supporting that group financially will come with criminal penalties across multiple states in the West. And there will be pressure put on the state backers of that insurgency to stop funding or supporting that insurgency. So while definitely a tool of uh, international politics and, and um, the great game of grand diplomacy, I guess when our audience is thinking of um, terrorism or a terrorist attack, they're more concerned perhaps with when one of these foreign conflicts is brought to their um, brought to their own country uh, in the form of the kind of attacks we saw in London in 2005 or um, in New York in 2001. Particularly in the context of the, the of post 9/11 world, there's this idea of, of of new terrorism that this is um, a new form of, of conflict or warfare being waged on a global scale. But I mean, terrorism itself, as as an act, is is nothing new. In particularly in Europe, it, it has a a very long history, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Inside Europe, and and also um, to an extent outside Europe, um, the first car bomb was detonated by a fellow by the last name of Buddha, ironically, on Wall Street of all places. In fact, he almost killed um, the Packard in Hewlett and Packard. But you're right; it goes back a lot further. I would argue that you know we've seen modern, what we would recognise as modern terrorism, as early as the 1600s. You know, there was obviously the gunpowder plot, and it goes on. The infernal machine, for example, which was um, rigged to try and kill Napoleon. We had the first assassination of a, a world leader by with explosives was conducted by a terrorist group, an anarchist group in Russia, in in a very similar attack tactically to what eventually would kill the Archduke Ferdinand and start the First World War. These are not new concepts. What is new, I would argue, is the concept of terrorism as this new form post-9-11, which is partly a result of the term itself becoming politicised. We talked about the politicisation of the term. Interestingly enough, that politicisation started after the 19th century. In the early 19th century, it was actually a term of of respect. It was a term that people would, would actually identify personally with. At the height of the Republican terror in France, as it was later called, um, leading Republicans would, would openly call themselves terrorists. They were, they were inflicting terror in order to save the Republic, and they believed and were justifiably um, condemned post-event. But at the time, it was a pretty popular thing to call oneself a terrorist. That has only changed in the West fairly recently, I would argue. Yeah, it's certainly something that's gone through an evolutionary um, process, just like all other sort of um, political and, and social terms do. Uh, this concept, just getting back to new terrorism as a post-9-11 thing, though, particularly terrorism in its way that might be most recognized today, this is something I, I personally have a big problem with. The authors that champion this idea typically point to new terrorism as being something that is inherently religious. Organizations that practice it uh, tend to occupy, in their minds, a sort of a horizontal organization that's decentralized rather than the traditional hierarchical organizations of particularly the terrorist, left-wing terrorist groups in the, in the 1970s and so on. And to probably most importantly to them, this idea, this new religious decentralized terrorism is something of an, uh, has a, something of an unrestrained brutality to it. But this is, I mean, I, that's a really problematic assumption to make, I think, uh, partly because if you look at the discourse and um, the internal language used by many terrorist groups throughout the 20th century alone, although they might have sort of left-wing or communist ideologies uh, as their justification, the way they invoke those are uh, often quite religious and apocalyptic in, in a lot of ways. They talk about you know, the clash of, of ideologies and, and the language we're familiar with in the broader scope of the Cold War. More than that, though, this idea of unrestrained brutality, I mean, terrorism and committing a terrorist act, you know, an, an attack on a civilian target, is brutal. I mean, it is a brutal act. But if you look at the stats involved, I mean, the, the global annual death toll from acts of terrorism, aside from 2001, which is an outlier, has remained relatively unchanged for about 30-odd years. Yeah, and, you know, we, we do see mass casualty deliberate events occur, you know, earlier in the, early in the 20th century and even into the 19th century. For example, uh, we talked about Alexander II's assassination. 
the only reason he was actually killed was that the would be assassins uh, were throwing grenades at his carriage and it wounded and killed a number of civilians. Alexander got out of his carriage to check on the rest of his party and the civilians and was then killed. They certainly had no compunction about killing civilians um, to achieve their goal. You know, the King David bombing is another example, although warnings were sent. They certainly were not adverse to the, the prospect of killing civilians. We, As we move forward, though, you do see this as we go forward. I mean, you mentioned September 11, of course, is a massive outlier. But even before that, we do see events where we would have had a mass casualty event, but it wasn't necessarily linked to this new form of terrorism. You know, Timothy McVeigh, very different type of terrorist. Um, even if we look at the first World Trade Center bombing, which by an absolute stroke of luck wasn't a mass casualty event, and it, it actually came down to the fact that the truck was parked just a little bit further away from where it needed to be. Had the explosion been a, a tiny bit stronger or the truck a little bit closer to the, the wall in particular, it would have flooded and then collapsed the World Trade Center. And this was several years before 9-11. So I think you're 100% right there. This is not a new concept, despite what they call it. The other thing to, to call into question here is, is the actual impact, the danger that, that terrorism really really poses. So, I mean, we've talked about 9-11 being an outlier. To, to give you another kind of point of, of perspective, in the year of the Paris attacks in 2015, and these are all stats, by the way, from the Global Terrorism Database, which collates all of this information. It's uh, put up for free. It's a wonderful resource if you're sourcing this kind of data. So from the year of the Paris attacks in Western Europe, uh, there were 151 fatalities from terrorist acts, 148 of which were in France and connected to that, those actual um, attacks. There were 354 attempted attacks across Western Europe in that year, though. 329 of those failed to kill anyone. Two, over 290 of them didn't even injure anyone. Now, if you compare that to any number of the other sort of mainstream causes of death in general society for the same year, the, the road toll or um, accidental death from falling or any number of other factors. It's a tiny number in a society of hundreds of millions of people. But I think this is, this is the key here, and it really is in the name. And we've talked about the, the political influence of the name itself, but right there in the name, the goal of a terrorist attack is to cause terror. And despite the fact that there's, there's absolutely no suggestion by anyone remotely competent that the last, you know, 16 years of attacks have been overall linked, they've had an overall effect. Um, even as late as last year, we've an ANU poll found that over half of the adults they measured in Australia rated terrorism as one of their top concerns in their personal security. The terrorism reinsurance industry so for those at the uninitiated the reinsurance industry is the people who insure insurance companies in the event of major economic and usually large death toll attacks things like planes going down or another 9-11 that's worth billions upon billions of dollars now this is despite the fact that there never appears to have been a major threat to government or western democracies of any sort of destabilization since the advent of this new terrorism. And I'll just stop for a second to, to mention, this is what we meant, everybody, when we said this may come across as a little dispassionate and it in no way detracts from what we're talking about and the casualties involved and the tragedy of that. But in Australia, as an Australian, 59 times more likely to be killed by lightning. And you're four times more likely to be killed by getting out of bed, falling out of bed. Since 1978, there's only been 113 victims of terrorism in Australia. In half that time, we've had over 8,500 victims of car accidents, car-on-car -car accidents in this country. So I think in terms of what the impact has been, there's less danger involved, Alistair, and I think there's a, a lot more fear. And that fear has had a major societal consequence, particularly in Australia, that is disproportionate to the actual physical risk to an individual Australian. Yeah, uh, there's been a couple of good commentaries on that uh, effect, I think. Uh, one is by um, Jones, who says that there's sort of a basal sense of security that uh, we carry with us in a society, an, accept an underlying sense of safety that we feel through participation. You know, the government will 
look after you, um, we'll take care of your security. And by the, the deliberate and seemingly random targeting of, of civilians going about their daily tasks, Jones argues that terrorists fundamentally reshape that sense of base or security and break the intrinsic trust that we have in the society or in the state to keep us safe. I mean, it's not so much that it is likely to happen, but it's the apparent ability for it to happen at random to anyone at any time, despite the relative risk. And Jones argues that this, the frequency of the attacks, and in fact their this, this success or failure even, becomes far less relevant than our actual perception of the threat. And that then goes on to argue that this is the primary objective of the attackers themselves. It's not about killing as many people as possible, no matter what the proponents of new terrorism might have you think. That's not really relevant. It's much more about causing that sort of sociological damage and reshaping that, that base or security. Yeah, and I mean, you, you Alistair, are, are very aware of my pet theory that there's a law of diminishing returns when it comes to terrorist casualties. In the West, we see a, uh, a marked difference between when an attack is called a terror attack or is perceived a terror attack and when it's simply a crime. And the actual number of casualties doesn't actually matter as much to, as a societal base um, to the impact that it has on our response. Despite the fact that there's been such low relative casualties in Australia, we've passed some of the most draconian security legislation in the world, over 70 pieces of it since 9-11. And this is perpetuated by our media. Um, obviously, the latest version of this is the, the tragic incidents earlier this year in Burke Street Mall in Melbourne. And for those of you who aren't local, um, there was a, a man who drove through large numbers of people in the Burke Street Mall, and tragically a number of people lost their lives. And within the hour, the Herald Sun, which is the local one of the local papers here, had declared that this was a terrorist attack, an Islamic terrorist attack, and that a witness had heard him yelling Allah Akbar out of his window. Now, that sold papers. That got them a lot of clicks. But it also created a, a climate of fear and distrust in the police when they subsequently said that it wasn't a terror attack. Now, post-event, it's emerged that the fellow was actually a pretty fundamentalist Christian and that he was running from the police at the time and had some pretty serious mental health issues none of which is consistent with the paper's claims, which were then subsequently picked up elsewhere in the Australian media. So I think beyond simply our efforts as scholars to understand this effect, this disproportionate fear, we also have to acknowledge that our media has to take a leading role in this, has to realise that there are things in this country that are more dangerous to Australians than this fear of Islamic terror. And even to just keep it in terrorism, we and the Americans vastly underreport the dangers of right-wing, nationalistic or, or Christian terrorist movements in our country who are violent threats to other members of our society. And I think if we were actually keen on stopping these threats and reducing this risk to people, as opposed to simply placating this perceived fear that Alistair spoke about from Jones, we'd see it a lot more in our public discourse, and that's not what we're seeing. I guess coupled to this, the kind of popular fear that builds up, particularly in the European experience, and, and this is something I've done a little bit of work on, is the coupling of particularly an uncontrolled uh, migration and a, a fear of increased terrorism. There was a recent uh, Pew poll conducted in Europe in the, in the wake of the migration crisis there that uh, looked at people's perceptions of recent migrants and how they thought this was going to affect their security. And so one of the things they f uh, this poll found was that, on average, about 59% of respondents saw a potential for a rise in terrorism as a, a consequence of the migration crisis, and many more talked about failures to integrate within society. But, again, this is one of those things where, when you start looking at the numbers involved and the, the stats, the reality doesn't actually face up to the, the popular conception. In 2015, 63% of, of arrests on terrorism-related charges, again, within Western Europe, were EU citizens. 58% of, um, percent of the total number were actually born in the European Union. The similar cases, if you look at the perpetrators of attempted attacks or attacks in Australia, the perpetrators of the London bombing, and uh, time and time again you see this idea of the homegrown threat as opposed to 
um, a migratory threat. It's, it's often people from within their own country that do actually make that jump. I agree to an extent there. However, I think there's a danger in lowering the uh, expectations on the the one hand about the link between migration and, and terrorism, which I, I agree with you is is not supported by the facts, and also not acknowledging the fact that we have a there is a perceived rise in this this sort of lone wolf homegrown terrorism type concept, but that hasn't been supported by the data either. And so I think both of those are influenced by the same sort of discourse that, that we spoke about a second ago. However, there's some distinctions here, Alistair, I think it's worth getting into, um, particularly when you consider the fact that a lot of these um, first and second generation migrants and, of course, homegrown radicalised individuals have other factors at play that aren't necessarily being picked up at the discourse level that people are looking at. Absolutely. One of the, the sharpest um, distinctions I've found is, is if you look at the, the profiles of the kind of people who join terrorist groups as opposed to the lone wolf, people who just make the decision to join a militant group, regardless if it's a, um, a left-wing group in the 1970s or an Islamic or Christian radical group today, generally speaking, are relatively sane and, and making, in their minds at least, a conscious and rational decision. There's very little evidence to suggest that militants or even Western ter terrorists in, who are participating in those groups are ultimately suffering from any statistical increase in, in mental health issues. Um, in fact, those groups are often a little bit self-filtering because the last thing you want is someone struggling with their own issues when you're trying to run an organization like that in secret. When you look at the lone wolf, however, it's a completely different profile, or rather Macaulay and Moskalenko, I think, uh, who have done a lot of research in, in trying to understand uh, the self-radicalization process, they identify two broad profiles. The first is this, and this is the majority of them, is, is this disconnected, disordered profile. This is the archetypal, um, socially isolated person typically dealing with acute or chronic mental health issues, who has a personal grievance which they adapt an existing ideology or develop an ideology around, which then motivates them to, to violent action. And that's the mainstay. They also highlight a couple of examples of a, of a different profile, which I find quite interesting, uh, which they term the caring consistency profile, which is where someone takes on a perce perceived personal responsibility, it, particularly in the wake of, of a particular moment, and they decide to act as a sort of moral imperative, again, independent of any organized group. Now, that, that second category is much rarer, uh, and typically, in a lot of sort of in the media reportage never gets the term terrorist. But the disconnected, disordered uh, approach, which shares a lot in common with your archetypal school shooter or serial killer, that there's a very different thing going on here as compared to, for example, the cell that conducted the, the 2015 Paris attacks. It's a very different kind of approach entirely. And you're 100% right in, in that. However, I think there's another issue here we have to look at, and that is the, the fact that a lot of these groups are, sorry, a lot of these individuals are linked with this terrorist sort of ideology um, for their actions. Now, particularly with this disconnected, disordered personality type or profile, we have individuals who would otherwise be um, joining um, sort of criminal elements, uh, gangs, for example, um, or would be conducting a violence or antisocial behaviour on their own, uh, which connect with an ideology that speaks to them on some level and therefore commit violence uh, in response to often quite vague calls to arms by terrorist media units. But particularly with this personality type, I think we have to remember that we can't get swept up in the ideology, in the larger group. These individuals are often acting alone. We have to, in our response and in our preemptive measures, it should always be, I think, based on the individual and based on stopping their actions, stopping their radicalization, as opposed to getting caught up in the concept of them being this, you know, archetypical villain. It, particularly if you look at recent cases in Australia, though, there is a bit of an intersection here between the disconnected, disordered lone wolf and issues surrounding migration. Uh, for those who aren't aware, in Australia we've had a number of instances, particularly with young second or third generation adolescents, taking on this this self-radicalization process and, and attempting an attack. There was a teenager who attempted to stab police at an interview uh, over why his passport had been suspended and was uh, shot and killed by, by those officers. There was also a, a young kid in Sydney who shot a 
civilian employee of, of the New South Wales Police in, an, again, an unprovoked, uh, self-radicalized attack. And there's been some early research in this game, who we mentioned before, has argued that there's a, um, a strong link in second or third generation migrants taking on this process because they reject their sort of minority status in a way their parents didn't and take on a, a downward assimilation. Now, I think he, uh, he starts on the right end there, but I think he sort of misses the point here. But several psychologists, led by uh, Stevens, who you'll find in the reading, identify that, that particularly second and third generation adolescent migrants have a number of psychological stress factors that the rest of the population don't, and adolescents are already under a lot of psychological stress factors. But particularly in their um, adoption into their, their new society, they often experience stress factors that lead them to an increased risk of emotional behavioral problems, some of which may be violent, some of which may involve this lone act of terrorism. But what, most importantly, what both authors identify is that this isn't really helped by an emphasis of these hard power responses, which in the end polarize the communities. The increased visible surveillance of those communities, the media rhetoric, um, the expansion of police powers, can contribute massively to this, this disengagement and dissatisfaction, which can be a, a sort of unfreezing moment for people who are already in that vulnerable state. And I think this sort of brings us back to the question, so how should we treat domestic terrorism, particularly this lone wolf? Is it, is it a crime or is it a part of a global insurgency? And uh, my argument is that really, at the end of the day, this, like you said, this should be treated on an individual basis. And the hard power responses particularly should be de-emphasized because they don't, they don't work. Uh, to an extent, they, they work in the fact that, you know, um, the government gets to appear strong. Um, quite often the, the attacker dies and therefore can be paraded around, so to speak. Uh, it, what it translates to in practicality, of course, is we see a vast increase in people's uh, willingness to employ military tactics and high-power technology in order to contain what's considered a terrorist threat as opposed to any number of our, our other versions. The, the problem is, though, that if we accept that the, the, the objective of the terrorist organization is to disrupt that basal security and that, that organic trust in society um, to protect its members, those increased responses play into it. I mean, that they are as destructive um, to that sense of security uh, as the attack itself is, and sometimes even more so. So it's, it becomes a self-reinforcing cycle. Not only do these... Um, these more militant responses fail to contain the threat and emphasize the threat beyond its actual objective damage. It also creates a, a sort of social scenario that allows more people to become disaffected and potentially, particularly in the wake of, of the broad spectrum media campaign of organizations like the Islamic State, who would otherwise have virtually no impact, um, it allows them to, to spread their message more thoroughly with with increasingly disaffected uh, members of society. I don't have a problem, per se, with having the option to disrupt an ongoing an attack or event, but the visibility and the emphasis that's placed on it, I think, is, is ultimately self-defeating. I think the practicality, though, Alistair, is an aside here. Um, you know, best practice, of course, would be to have these soft power responses in the same way, actually a very similar way, to how we deal with gangs and youth violence in this country when it isn't a hot-button political issue, as it has become in, in Melbourne recently with, with Apex. But as a result of that, that basal strength disruption, feeding into that cycle becomes really attractive. People that don't have a level of understanding of what the impact of that is, or, as is the case in most policymakers, have other influences that they have to, that they have to satisfy actually having an armed police response to an event is quite comforting to the people involved. It is a way for the state to show that they are in control when they are simply not. Um, you know, you and I and, and anyone that studied terrorism knows for a fact that you can never be on top of everything. However, by having that increased visible police response, it is a way to project a feeling of security onto people in the hope that the majority will feel safe from the minority. And the hope of policymakers is that, that trade-off will always work out in their favour, even though, as we both know, it doesn't, doesn't always. And I think, arguably, if you look in the context of, of, and this is the one and only time, I swear, that I'm going to use this a term on the podcast, the global war on terror, I think that's sort of kind of demonstrated that that's just 
a, a completely false approach. The reality is that um, people are feeling less secure than they have been previously. I mean, in the words of uh, of the IRA in the wake of the 1984 Brighton Hotel bombing, we have to we only have to get lucky once. You have to be lucky all the time. We are more and more willing to accept, at least as a society, the concept, the fiction that we are winning this so-called global war on terrorism. And I also don't like that term. There's this feeling that we can play into that fiction and people will spend money to relive that fiction, to reinforce that fiction in themselves, that by having these attacks, by projecting hard power, going out and killing these enemies that we we find so distasteful, we're somehow winning this war, that it is a war that we can win. And I think to bring it back to the, the subject of the podcast, terrorism is a tool. It's not a war. And that's why I don't like the term war on terrorism. And, and I know Asta will agree with me on this. But people buy into that myth. And I think that's what states are trying to play into. That's what pop culture is trying to play into in order to help us put this fiction over our lives, in order to believe that we're winning, even though we're not actually fighting in an effective way. More than that, that fiction plays into exactly the kind of fearful response that grants terrorism its power. Ultimately, if the real scale and intensity of these events are put in the broader context of the dangers of society, if we refuse to allow ourselves to be terrorized, then the tool itself becomes powerless. Well, that's all we have time for, folks. If you've enjoyed the show, and have some ideas of some of the topics you'd like us to cover, why not send us your thoughts? Be it by email, on our blog, or through the comments section below, we're always open to hearing feedback from our listeners, and especially in shaping the show to cover the issues that interest you. If you want further reading on today's episode, or any of the previous ones, you can find them on our blog at www.onwarthepodcast.wordpress.com, or in the links below. Next week, we'll delve into the laws of war, the formal and informal laws and norms that have governed the conduct of armed conflict in modern history. As always, thank you for listening, and good night.